Welcome into K State Online. I am Mason Vogt. That is Drew Galloway, and we are here on this Friday to get you ready for the Cats and Cougs, which is still many hours away, depending on what time you're watching this. Uh, we are over what? I guess it would be 36 hours away uh, if you're watching this when the video first goes up, because it will be before 9 a.m. And the Cats and Cougs, they tip off 9 o'clock Central Time on Saturday night, ESPN2. Uh, this is the first real taste of what it's like having these new teams in the Big 12. It's going to become a much more common occurrence, I'm sure, once Arizona and Arizona State and Utah, as well as Colorado, are in here. Uh, but there's got to be somewhere for all these West Coast teams that are now in new places to play. And the TV networks are going to love being able to throw, you know, when it when it comes to KU and basketball or – when Fox is able to have Ohio State football games at 9 o'clock at night because they're playing at UCLA, they're going to eat that stuff up. So everybody just might as well get used to it. Uh, and this is a nice way to get everybody kind of ready to roll. And for a lot of you watching this right now, you're probably thinking to yourself, probably even just five days ago, you know what? I'm probably not going to make it through that entire game because what's the point? Well, the point kind of changed once K-State beat KU on Monday night, and then you have to start telling yourselves, this team might have a pulse again. So we are here to talk about K-State and BYU and see what the next step is. So there are a lot of areas that we can talk about BYU because they're a fascinating team. Yeah. They weren't expected to do much this year, and they jumped, if not in the top 10, very close to it early in the season. Uh, they've kind of faltered a little bit with Big 12 play but they are still one of the better teams in the league in terms of where they sit in the net and I guess the overall perception of them still being in the top 25. Uh, so you can just pick where we start on the Cougars for this game, Drew. Uh, to start, I'll throw out two that uh, get used to this because not it just won't be a basketball thing. Football-wise, next year, K-State might have the Colorado and BYU road games both start at 9.30. That's a good point. <laughs> And that could easily happen uh, next year. Uh, but when you look at BYU, they are just a fascinating team uh, because they kind of took the page of the Rockets back in like the 2018 era where it was it is shoot a lot of threes, shoot a lot of layups, not nothing in between. And I think I did. I looked at a lot of their stats and did their players to watch and uh one of their players uh i believe it's a uh, nell uh shoot his 71 percent of his shots this year are from three like it, it's the craziest thing and like almost all of their starters around half of their shots are from three so if you're if you haven't watched byu before Get ready to see a lot of three balls go in the air yeah he's he and not only is it that he's taking a lot of them you know those guys you'd be like Oh, he's a volume dude. He, you know, he still shoots thirty five percent, which would still be good. I, I would take a thirty five percent three point shooter on K State's roster right now. He shoots forty three percent from three yeah. on the season on one hundred eighteen attempts from deep. He that takes is a lot and makes a lot. Yeah, that is uh, that is a big big number for BYU. Who also, I mean, there's legit depth on this team. They have seven yeah, guys that average nine points a game. Uh, six of them are in double figures, so they're balanced and. They pretty much all can shoot it, too. I mean, the worst uh, three-point shooter that that gets minutes for them in terms of guys that might actually take them is Spencer Johnson. He's at only 31%. But everybody else is uh, in, a, in a range where you go, yeah, th that's dangerous when they shoot the ball. Don't let them do that. I, I will say that the one shooter that they have, along with Johnson, who is 31%, uh jackson robinson is kind of he is the volume shooter because he's taken almost 40 more threes than the next player uh which is nell actually which makes it even more impressive that nell shoots 43 percent because robinson's only 36 percent on a lot yeah. of attempts so they're, they're a fascinating team to watch they don't get to the free throw line a bunch because they shoot a lot of threes and then the the thing that kind of concerns me in this game and we kind of touched on it in uh, the Big 12 show that we did, is that BYU does get to the offensive glass a lot. And that has been K-State's uh, biggest issue, along with turnovers this season, is they are not a great defensive rebounding team. So you worry about that from a matchup standpoint. Yeah, and here's another fascinating thing about BYU, real quick, just to, you know, numbers-wise looking at it. 
BYU, at least every single player on their roster has attempted a three this season. Yes. Uh, I don't know how many teams in the country you would be able to say that for, where at least every guy on the roster has gotten a shot up. K-State, they have they have one guy that that has played. I'm not counting Tamont Lindsay. They would have two if I counted him. They have one guy that has played that has not attempted a three this season. I would guess you know who it is. It's got to be Colbert. Yeah, it's Jarrell Colbert. So uh, the next closest to that would be Michaela Rich. He's only attempted one three. And if I remember correctly, it went – pretty poor it was not it was like a three that you go nope never I, again i also want to say that michaela Bridges three might have been in the central arkansas game when they were up like 50 that would that would make some sense and that's about the only time <laughs> that he should get that shot off yeah look byu they are about shooting it it's it's my kind of basketball to watch i will say this though like we talked about how they do with you know shooting the three in big 12 play they're getting 54 percent of their points from three um and then they don't get to the free throw line in Big 12 play. They're the worst at doing that in the league. And you think about K State. Yeah. Well, yes, they struggle to grab defensive rebounds, something that you know BYU with the offensive rebounding is good at. It is a benefit, I think, to K State with this matchup, especially considering how the defense played on Monday night against KU. Because you get that win, the defense is playing better. I think you can get the buy-in back to a spot that you need it in. And I think we might see K-State return to how they played. And I think this K-State defense, while maybe a, you know, a little scary at times and they might cause some frustration, I think that the way BYU plays gives them an opportunity to go get this win in Provo. Whereas if they were playing somebody else in BYU situation with a little bit of a different style, I think it'd be tough to say they go on the road to get a, a victory. And it's still not going to be easy. I'm still not saying they do it, but – there is a world out here where K-State is really able to throw BYU off because they're a little bit of a one-trick pony. It, it's just such a volatile way of playing basketball. And like that, that's where we're kind of heading towards is teams that just shoot a lot of threes. But it's so hard to repeat that on a game-by-game -game basis. And, and like, I mean, it's why the Rockets never won a championship when they did it. It's just, it's very interesting. And like, I've watched probably two or three BYU games all this season, but the, I watched start to finish their game against Oklahoma. And it was strange because BYU averages like 32 three point attempts this season and only got like 24, 25 off against Oklahoma. It was like they, they struggled to get the shots off. And I think that's where, if Casey was going to win this game, that's probably the recipe is to you know, you, because you can kind of run the shooters off the line a little bit. And if a team can't get the threes off, they're obviously not going to make them. And we kind of saw how volatile it was when BYU raced out to like an 18 point lead in Lubbock and then got hammered in the second half and lost. Yeah. So it, it, it's, a, it's an interesting way of going about it. And I, I'm, really interested to see how Casey wants to defend the three point line, because like how we talked about with uh, Trevor Nell, he only shot two, three pointers against uh, Oklahoma, like the, mm -hmm. Oklahoma took him away. And you wonder if he is kind of like the glue of just the chucking threes. And yeah, but what, what's interesting too, is that BYU, not really a good defensive team under Mark Pope, but they're a very good defensive team this year. Yeah, it's going to be fascinating. And defensively, what BYU does will be interesting to watch in this game because here are a couple of numbers for you. These come from uh, KSU underscore fan, and, and you'll get more of this in, in the full pick and preview from him. But he kind of shared some of these with us earlier today. Uh, this season, so BYU, as we know, off to a pretty good start to the year, 16 and 6. In the 16 games they've won, they have shot better from three than their opponent. And in the six games they've lost, all six, they have shot worse than their opponents. So, yes, I mean, maybe K-State comes out and holds them to, you know, 25% or something from three. But in all likelihood, this is going to come down to K-State also needing to make shots from the yes. outside in this game, which is something that has been an up and down type of thing for K-State. There's kind of a, a love-hate relationship with that shot. K-State does take a good number of them. They just don't always make them. Now, 
Monday night, they were 9 of 26 from three. Another positive development is the fact that Tyler Perry, he's averaging almost 23 a game over the last three times out, and he's shooting 41% from three in, in that stretch. They need him to come through. They need Cam Carter to give them a similar performance from three like he did against KU where he was three of seven. He hit some significant ones. And you're going to need Arthur Kaluma to return to the form that he had been in because he had some struggle shooting the ball the last two games against Oklahoma State and Kansas. So it's not only about how K-State defends in this game, but they have to take advantage of BYU, make the open looks they get from three because kind of like what you're talking about with them being a bad defensive team, BYU's 11th in the Big 12 in three-point field goal percentage defensively. They give, they're give they letting opponents shoot 36% from three. Meanwhile, you flip it around, K-State, they are still well under 30% for what they do defensively uh, in, in Big 12 play. I think the – let's see if I can find the, the number again uh, on defense for them. Uh, they're holding league opponents to under 28% from three this season. And we saw that on yeah, Monday against yeah. KU – uh, I mean, Kevin McCuller had a tough time. Johnny Furphy didn't do anything in the game. He got his, his shot blocked. Um, and I don't know that Hunter Dickinson took at least one. I, he took he, he two, took two and, and missed them both. So we saw K-State's defense, I think, probably play their best game of the season on Monday against KU. Now you just have to do it against the team that has shooters everywhere. And one final note I'll toss in here, and I talked about how concerning this was with Iowa State because they have so many options on who can carry the load. BYU has six different players that have scored 20 points in a game this season. Now, yes. that may not be surprising given the fact that we talked about they have you know six guys that average 10 a game and a seventh that averages nine, but it's notable, and this is going to probably require, I mean, outside of the KU game and maybe better than that, you're going to need your best defensive performance to win this game if you're K-State. Yeah, it'll, it'll require, I think, a better defensive effort than Monday night just because of the added uh, element of playing on the road. And role players tend to play better at home. And I'm not saying that nobody on BYU is necessarily a star, but I don't think that they have anybody that would make the all either All-Big 12 team at this stage right now. So they're they're a team of a bunch of guys that are pretty good and are able to. They have a lot of guys that can attack you. Team full but, of system quarterbacks. Yeah, yes, but I'm not sure if there's anybody that really scares you necessarily, which is the interesting thing I think. Um, I, I'll also add in this isn't like a crazy matchup for K State size wise. BYU not extremely big. They they have some length, but. It's more of, I think, uh, they're just uh, going to uh, play more of a style that's conducive to K-State in the sense that they're not super long. Like Houston also isn't a huge team, but they are very, very long. And you saw that kind of gives, uh, or that gave problems for K-State. But BYU, not like extremely long. So yeah. I, I, I don't see this team like overwhelming K-State. Uh, athletically, like you saw Houston do. Thinking about one other element, then this kind of came into play on Monday night. You got a good game out of Jarrell Colbert for K-State. Uh, David Gasson picked it back up again. And Will McNair plays a lot, and he's, of the bigs, probably the most likely to give you something on offense. What What is your expectation for the K-State bigs in this game and how they can be used after you've you know kind of combed over and looked at how uh, BYU sets up as an opponent. So I actually was going to make Gerald Cor uh, one of my MVPs for this game. Okay, well then let's get into it. Uh, I th I think that uh, Gerald Corbett kind of unlocks something with the offense that we haven't seen all season because it makes everything is spaced out a lot better when he's on the floor. And when Will McNair has been on the floor lately, I think D.Y. noted it. Uh, a couple different places that the ball just kind of sticks when Will McNair gets it in the post. But Jarrell Colbert had three assists against KU. He looked super comfortable with the ball in his hands. I know that we kind of make the joke about mid-range shots aren't a great shot, mm -hmm. but Jarrell Colbert can knock those down. And we've seen it, and we've seen him knock it down before. But I think that the light bulb was kind of coming on for him. And again, with a team that's not like uberly athletic, with BYU, 
like you would think that this would be a pretty good matchup for Gerald Colbert. And, and I just think that he frees up so much on offense and then, and then is a menace on defense. I mean, he, he gave Hunter Dickinson a lot of problems. Like I, I know that the, the stat sheet looks like Hunter Dickinson had a pretty good game, but when Gerald Colbert was out there, Dickinson didn't do a whole lot. Yeah, no, that, that that's true. I mean, in K-State, we, we talk about this. Hunter Dickinson still put up numbers in that game, but they forced him to miss 10 shots. He was 15% under what he normally shoots from the field. Like They disrupted him, and it played a huge role in the game. I think it's just about finding the guy that works for you with the bigs and finding a way to you know make them give you something in this game. And uh, Jerome Tang, I don't think he's been in too many games afraid of just an, an early hook on guys, but I think it's just about finding a rotation with these dudes because – None of K-State's bigs are good enough to go an entire game without screwing up so bad that you're like, oh, yeah, you can leave them out there. No, there's going to come a moment where all three bigs, you tell yourself multiple times, he can't be on the floor right now. So it's just they're going to have to push the right buttons, especially in this game where you're going to have a lot of shooters running around and the the bigs are going to be tested. And that's, you know, one of the things that will be interesting about this game is I mean, it, when Jarrell Colbert is out there, how much are you asking of him? And, yeah. and what position is he in defensively? To Is he having to help? Is he having to chase out the wing? Because we know Jerome Tang has talked about like his conditioning is not there to be on the floor for as much as people might want. And if he's having to chase smaller dudes around a bunch, that, that could wear him down a lot quicker than what is already the case. Yeah, you do worry about that in this game. But I, I think that he... He's one of my MVPs in this game because of how good BYU is at offensive rebounding. That if he is able to at least make it harder for BYU to get offensive rebounds, I think that he's doing his job. Which is kind of leads me into uh, the the other MVP that I have isn't really a person that we know yet, uh, but it's it's whoever guards Spencer Johnson because Spencer Johnson, uh, despite only being six five and playing one of the guards. Uh, one of the guard spots for BYU is a really good offensive rebounder. He's second on the team and is their second leading rebounder total. So whoever guards him, and it's going to be one of the guards, has to be able to know where he is and box him out. And because he's he's also not a great three point shooter like we like like we mentioned, so you need to be able to just box him out because he's one that you would probably let shoot, but when the ball's in the air, you have to know where he is. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see. Uh, for me, uh, Tyler Perry's got to be one of them. I know he's done a lot over the last three games for K-State, but you need this to kind of be the Tyler Perry you get. And not necessarily to the extent we've seen, you know, averaging 23 over the last however many, but that three-point percentage is what you need out of him. Yes. You need him to be able to shoot it effectively and knock down three or four a game to really make a difference for you. So I would put him into that category. And then you're you're just relying on one of the other guys to step up with him, either Kaluma or Carter, uh, and and both of the both or at least one of those guys has to come through by, like I said, doing what Cam Carter did against KU, where he was three of seven from three. Nothing groundbreaking, but he hits some good and big ones. Uh, and Arthur Kaluma certainly has the ability. He's just you know been down a little bit lately, so I, I would throw those two in there. I don't think that K State wins without Cam Carter's start Monday yes. night. The, those two yep. threes kind of set the tone of, hey, like, we are going to be able to run some sort of offense tonight and, like, make some shots when, when we need it. Uh, the other thing that's not really groundbreaking, like with, with Tyler Perry, is you, you would like to see him score in the first half. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> like, uh, he's averaging 22.7 in the last three games, and I think about three quarters of the points have came in the second half. It, I don't know what they need to do if they need to just tell them that it's the second half when the game starts. <laughs> but it what makes him so frustrating for a lot of people and even myself is is that he doesn't really do anything in the first half scoring wise when you probably need him to. Well, and you think he missed a couple of good looks in the first half against KU from three that if they go in, like maybe you're dealing with a different game in the first half, even like. And certainly if K-State ends up losing that game, we're talking about it and going, man, you missed opportunities. So you need him to come through consistently when the looks are there. 
I mean, it, it's nice when he has that, you know, four minute stretch where he's just untouchable, but just to add a little bit more consistency throughout the game. And that would uh, certainly be a big boost to K-State's chances. Oh yeah. Cause they're, they're getting a lot of good looks for Tyler Perry. I mentioned it uh, because uh, one like pretty smart basketball, like account that just dissects plays uh, pulled up the, the play that gave K-State the four point lead with Perry's three in overtime. K-State's running a lot of great sets to get sh- to get shooters and specifically Tyler Perry open in the last four or five games, which has gone kind of unnoticed because the offense has been pretty pretty bad at times. But they're running a lot of good sets to get shot to get shooters open. You just have to knock it down. And I, I know that's easier said than done, but in a, in a game like this, especially where no lead is really safe when you play BYU because of how they play and they're never out of the game. If you have that time for a kill shot, you got to make it. Yep. Yep. Very true. Uh, All right. So Ken Palm has BYU winning 76 to 65. What is the pick and preview for this game for you? Uh, I think that it'll be closer than that because this isn't really a matchup that you see K-State really get overwhelmed in often. BYU doesn't really turn teams over much. They do attack the offensive glass, which will be the biggest thing. And then the thing that BYU does the best at, K State is really good at, at defending the three point line. So I think I do think that BYU probably wins still, and I'll say seventy one to sixty six BYU. Okay, uh, I will take BYU by a final score of seventy three to sixty one. I think. Look, I I think there's a chance K State can win this game. There's just too much that would suggest that. Uh, you shouldn't pick them in this game. You know, one of those where like the data says to do this and this. Uh, K State has gotten back to back strong games from their big three, uh, combining for fifty and then fifty eight points, and kind of putting it together. We've talked about it a lot this year. I mean, and what's this team going to look like when you get all three of them putting it together? You've gotten back to back games of it, and you're only one and one because the defense was really bad in Stillwater. And I just don't know that you're going to get that again. And who else is going to be able to step up? That's a question to me. So I think it's, I think it can be close. I think K State can win the game, but it does feel like one of those that BYU probably has it at arm's length. And then, you know, they hit a couple of big threes or something with three minutes left and you kind of know what the outcome is. So uh, I will take the, the Cougars in this one. And that, that again is just the Ken Palm line. The official line won't come out till. Uh, Friday after we've recorded and posted this. So it, I would guess it would be a little bit lower than that. I, my, I, my guess will be like BYU, like minus nine, nine and a half. Yeah, that would seem about right. So the, the other thing I, I will say to go along with kind of what you were saying is uh, with K State not having a game in the midweek this week, this is the time to empty the tank and see if you can steal it because the, the opportunity is there. I've said all season long, I don't think that BYU is the top eight team in the country, like Net and Ken Palm both have. The, this is a team that is beatable. I mean, Cincinnati kicked their butts in Provo to start Big 12 play. So it, it's a gettable game. K-State will just have to play one of their best games of the year. Yes, they will. Next four games for K-State against quad one opponents. So a lot of chances for some much-needed wins ahead for the Wildcats. It'll be tough to do it on the road uh, in in the elevation with BYU, but certainly not out of question, and things are uh, a lot more interesting after their victory on Monday night against KU. So that will do it for us. For more coverage of K-State and BYU and everything else going on with the Wildcats on both the football and basketball side, you can head over to kstateonline.com where you can find stuff from Drew, stuff from DY, and then uh, KSU underscore fans preview as well for the game. And if you're not signed up, you can hop on the message board once you do to get all the info you need about K-State and certainly a lot of other stuff that may not even have anything to do with K-State or any of the hot takes you want to pop off, you can do them there. And be sure to also subscribe to the YouTube and the podcast platform. So for Drew Galloway, I am Mason Voth. Thank you for watching K-State Online.